This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today we're going back to World War II, where one of us is going to be the Axis powers and the others an allies. This is a two-player game called The Fog of War. This is uh, from Stronghold Games, designed by Jeff Engelstein. It takes about two hours to play. This game has a lot of bluffing in it, a lot of uh, misdirection. Uh, and so let's take a look. I'm going to show you how it's played, and then I'll see you on the other side. Now this two-player asymmetrical game is about World War II. So you have the Axis side and you have the Allied sides. And both sides control certain territories at the beginning of the game. Now the game is played over five years and over different years different provinces are going to be joining the war. And there's also some countries that are neutral that have some defense to start the game. Now what's trying to happen is the Axis are trying to either get 70 points at the end of a year. That's one of their win conditions. And the Allies' win condition is they're trying to control both German provinces at the end of a year. If they do, the game ends immediately and they win. If neither of those two things happen, the 70 points for the Axis or those uh, German provinces for the Allies, at the end of the game, uh, if the Axis control two of the secret provinces, so there could be one of these six around Germany, so Scandinavia, Poland, Balkans, Yugoslavia, Italy, and Paris. At the beginning of the game, the uh, Axis player actually gets three of those cities or provinces as cards. Secretly they will choose two of these and those will be the secret victory end game conditions. So two of those six are going to be secret conditions that the Axis player is trying to control at the end of the game as one of the last victory conditions. If it gets into the game and that player does not control those then the allies win. Now each player during the game is going to be taking turns and they'll be doing that by doing a multitude of things. But the game really hinges around this operation wheel, which is how you program actions. So let's look at some of the different cards and how you go about a turn. Now both Axis and Allies each get their own wheel and their own deck of cards. And they're, they're different but they're similar. The different types of cards are attacking cards. This one can attack one through, through a water invasion. This is a ground invasion. All these cards, there's different ones that range from one to three. There's some that are dummy cards that are just zero. There's an air card which can be used for a ground or a water. And then later on in the game you'll be getting some that are just like fort. They're just defense cards. And you'll notice that these ones say start. You have a big starter deck. And then the, uh, the Axis has a, a set of cards that you can be that can be purchased later in the year uh, after 1940. The Allies have a deck that uh, is very different, but also very similar to the types of cards. And they have different cards that come up pretty much every year. So their deck builds over the course of the year. The, the years, the Allies, uh, the Axises get theirs, uh, get one so, sort of one extra deck to buy from at the end of the year 1940. Each player has a player board that holds their draw deck, their discards, and the place where cards go when you win or lose battles. Now, at the beginning of the turn, you'll have three cards in your hand until it's the end of the year, basically. But you're going to be able to choose many things to do with these actions. One thing you do is create a new operation. So usually what happens is this turns at the beginning of your turn, but in the first turn, it just it's, it is what it is. So what you can do is you can take, you have a deck of cards that has every country in the game there. Uh, the ones you own are actually in front of you, the ones you don't own are in that deck. So you can pick one. So I'm going to pick Yugoslavia. I can pick as many of these as I want. Maybe I'll do a three and a dummy card. And I'll put these together face down. Everything's always face down in this game as a new operation. I had just programmed this. Now this operation wheel is interesting because at the beginning of my next turn, this will turn and this is where I can place a new operation. I can always add to older operations. If it's here, I cannot launch it because you have to plan. But the next turn, I can launch this, but the defense gets a, a, a plus one attack. Here I could launch it even, here I could launch it even. If I waited really long for the right time, I get a, a attacker gets a plus one. And if it's not done by the time this gets around, this gets disbanded and, and gone away. So this is how this works. Every turn, you're turning this, so you're planning things plenty in, in, you know, in, in future. Another thing you can do is you can add cards to defense. So all the city, all the provinces have places around the board, and they're all numbered like they are on the board. And I own Berlin right now as Axis, so maybe I'll put a card here for defense. Another thing you could do is use Intel. Uh, Axis starts with five, Allies starts with seven, and you can flip during your actions. You can use two of these to use some intel. And what this does is maybe I want to look at some his operation wheel. You can actually look at any spot there, or maybe one of the spots that they have uh, put down there for defense. So what happens is these would get shuffled and you'd look at half of these rounded down and you'd put them back so they don't know what you saw. 
and but and you only got to see half of these now but if i if i go like uh, spend two they can then spend one more to flip it to stop me and you can go back and forth always spending one more than the other player but of course you're going to run out at some point so you can use the intel for two during your actions after all your actions are done for that turn you can spend one to do it so it's cheaper but you can't capitalize on it that turn you know, because it's after all your actions then. And then you just draw three cards. So that's it. You're basically turning the operation wheel. You're doing all as many actions as you want, and you're possibly using Intel, and then you're drawing cards, and those that's how the turns work. So let's say a few turns had gone by, and I'm turning this, and I'm going to attack. It's even, no defense, no attack, extra. And so then we would just basically say what's going to happen in this operation. So first we would describe where we're going. So I would say, yep, we're going to Yugoslavia. And first things, you'd have to make sure you have supply. So the Axis has supply out of three countries, which means you have to draw, uh, go from country to country from a supply through countries you own to the country that you're going against. So Yugoslavia is right next to a, a country I had supply. So I could attack this. I can't attack Greece. Uh, I could attack Greece from this supply line, but I'd be going through an invasion through water and I would have needed to have used the boats. And anytime you use boats to attack, the defense always gets a plus four defense. So it doesn't make sense to go here when I can come through Yugoslavia and then do it cheaper with less defense. Uh, but yeah, the supply line. So if I did not have this supply line going through, I couldn't attack it. For example, if I wanted to attack this country, Moscow way over here, I couldn't do it because I have supply through Berlin and through Poland and I would be I would need to launch from one of these two adjacent to get here so I can't attack here you kind of have to go through things and later on if like this got if I had this but this got taken out this no longer has uh, supply so I couldn't continue to go you have to keep the supply chain going and uh, you know the, the allies have different supply places as well so I would say where I'm going we make sure I have supply and then we see what I have well this was a zero it was a dummy card so it got discarded and that's there in case people use Intel on it. And I have three. So then we look at Yugoslavia's defense. So I'll just put my three here that I had. Yugoslavia, now this was a neutral territory, so it started with a card. Some of them start with one, some of them start with two or three cards. And these are usually values of one or two. But there could have been other cards here from the allied player. So we would flip these over and you need to essentially double this to win. And plus any modifier. So this is one, I would need to have at least two. I do, I have a three. So I would have conquered that territory. Now, if the defense had more than me, I would have lost. If it's in between, meaning I have more than it, but not double, then it goes into what's called a quagmire, which means this is going to basically, this battle would go on to the, this would go on the board, and this is gonna basically go next turn, there's going to be a battle, but people can be adding to this. You know, defense can add to it, then you can add to it, That, but you're going to be resolving it next turn. It's kind of like an ongoing battle that takes more than one turn because you haven't yet got twice as many. And anytime a battle happens, the cards that you've won will go into your win pile, a certain amount of them, depending on this. Like, this had a defense of one, so I would have to put a card with at least one um, in my win pile, and the rest would go here for defense. So if I had a three there, but I also had a one, this one card would go in my win pile, and this three card would actually now occupy this as defense. So anything over double, some of it, is going to stay there for defending that, and the other one's going to go in my win pile. Now, if I had lost, the, the opposite would happen. Uh, anything that I lost would go in the lost pile. Now, this lost pile is interesting because towards the end of the year, uh, we're going to run out of cards. And once the first person has um, taken their last card into their hand, it then becomes winter. It makes it harder to attack. Which means any countries that don't have any special icons is a plus one defense. Anywhere that has snow is a plus two defense. Anywhere that has a sun is just, it doesn't get plus one, it's still just zero. Once the second player has also run a card, it's the end of the year. And essentially, we first we would count up the points. So each of these places have numeric values. And so for each country that access is the only one that scores points, they would score one point for this country. They would score all their points. So let's say they have, I don't know, five points at the end of the first round, let's just say. Remember, they're trying to get to 70 for a win condition at the end of a year, but only the access can score points. And then we would do this. We had some cards that we put in here when we won battles. Some things were discarded, like dummy cards and things that were disbanded and such. And so what happens is each of these cards go one after another to discard to win until you're done with all these. So this is sort of splitting up half your cards that were in your win pile you're going to get right back. The other half you're going to have to buy back here at the end of the year because this discard pile ends up being your draw pile for the next year. And again, the allies will end up having new cards on top of here at the end of each year that they'll be able to buy next year. And then each player, one at a time, is going to buy production points. Now, some of the countries have points and production, and some of them have just production. This is a two production. You add up all the production you have, 
and you'd look at where you are on the industry track. They start in certain spots. So let's say I was Access, and let's just say I had five production. Five production for my cards, eight here, it's the lower of the two. So you'd get uh, you know, five production points. And the production points you can spend to move your track up here. You can buy cards back. If you're the Access, you can buy up to half of your points in victory points, or you can buy two Intel for a point. But the Axis can only buy points if they control both of the German properties. And buying cards back, one for each point, you get to look through this deck and put some in here, which then will be your draw pile here for the next round. Now, generally, that's how the game's played. There are some many things that I left out, like, you know, there's certain things, like if you if, if Axis conquers Paris for the first time, then Paris, Vichy, Morocco, and uh, Levant also all goes to Axis. Some of these neutral Russian countries uh, provinces, if the Axis uh, attacks them, they automatically come into war, they all become allied, or they end up coming in at the beginning of 1943. So there's a lot of just different things that happen, same with USA and Canada. So there's all these different special cases too that I'm not going to go in detail. There's a lot going on in this game, but that's how you play. All right, well, there you have the Fog of War. Now, war games aren't something that I'm really into all that often. In fact, there's only one war game I own. It's 1775 Rebellion because it's sort of a light, fun team, team versus team type war game. Uh, so I'm not usually too into these at all. But this one really made me interested because of the mechanisms of this, where it's not really a dudes on a map, but there's no dudes on the map. It's really about, sure, you're taking over at provinces, but it's really about that whole wheel. Uh, so that's what interests me in this game. Uh, first, let me talk about the things that I think uh, could have been improved with the game, things that I did not like, and then we'll get to many of the things that I liked about it. Uh, the rulebook itself, um, this game has a lot of rules, uh, and the, the rulebook has a lot of blocks of text, which I think is, in war games, a lot of the ones that I've seen have them, have, you know, 5.2, 9.4, go to section 5.3, stuff like that. There's a lot of going back and forth. I had to use the rulebook almost the entire game, going back and forth. The first time playing it, after you know the game, it's a little bit easier. But the the rule book uh, has it has some ambiguities in there. Uh, things about you know purchasing cards, whether you get to look at them or not. Uh, neutral territories. Uh, if you fight them and you don't win, or it's in a quagmire, it actually already goes to the opposite player. Stuff like that that was sort of left out. I know the designer is putting together a fact and FAQ and errata right now, which will, which I hope they had when I had done this, but. Uh, paving the path, you guys will get to benefit from that. Uh, so the game was hard to learn from the rulebook. If someone shows you how to play this game and you play through it a whole time, it's really not that complex, but there's a lot of different concepts and things to think about with supply lines and, and, and things like that, and defenders. And So there's a lot to think about. It is a hard game to, to, to learn from the rulebook. I learned 200 games from the rulebook last year, and uh, this one was a difficult one to learn, but I'm glad I did. More on that a little bit later. Other things I think that could have been uh, improved here is the graphic design. The board felt kind of small for what it was. Um, the cards take up a lot of the board, uh, and the board was so small that in many instances, the tokens, when you place them on a country, cover either their name or a specific look, uh, another icon like, like sun or winter, or if it's a supply line or not. So I really wish this board was a full six panel board. It should have been grand, this game is an epic grandiose game. It should have had an epic and grandiose board. Having it be small like that, everything pushed together, things didn't work too well with that. Um, and plus also some of the color choices. You have all these Russian provinces that are sort of this like, this like reddish oranges color and they act completely different than the Balkans, which is right next to it. And the colors between those are almost the same color, but those countries act very differently. It was a poor choice in a lot of that graphic design. Uh, also, there was a special conditions and victories as to, hey, they could have two of these six, the allies have two of these six countries and they're not, you know, at the end of the game, they can win. But it's not always exactly obvious which six countries they were. They probably should have outlined them so when an allied player is playing, they could say, okay, I see which six are the possibilities. So there were definitely some graphic design misses, I think, in this game. All right, that's enough of the stuff that I didn't like. Let's get to the stuff I like, because this game is excellent. It is such a well-designed game. And again, I don't typically like war games, and a two-hour game for me has to be... Put it this way, anything over a 60-minute game for me has to be exponentially better for me to pull it out and keep it and want to play it more. 90 minutes has to be even more exponentially. Two hours. My first game of this lasted two hours and 25 minutes. Uh, after, if you both know what you're doing and you both have played it before, you can play it in two hours, maybe a little bit less. But even for a two-hour game, I've got to really like it. And this is fantastic. 
It's an exciting tension. It's back and forth. The whole element of the bluffing, that wheel is awesome. The fact that you're putting things down there and you're like, hmm, do I want to do it? I can't do it next round, but the round after that, ooh, if I really want it, I've got enough power, I can go in there even though the defender has a plus one. Or I can wait till it's the middle rounds, or I can really try to time it right where I have that last attack and get that thing going, get a plus one. It's really fun. It's fun with the intel. Hey, I want to look at this. No, you don't. You, you can block the intel and you can go back and forth using up a lot of your intel. Uh, when the right time to use those is interesting. And you look at them, you're like, you might be able to see they're going to Poland, but you might not see how much is there. Or you might see, oh wow, he's got three going somewhere, but I don't know where. And the other player doesn't know what you've seen. So it, it just, it, it, it invokes this tension in the game that I really, really enjoyed. Uh, I like how they had different victory conditions. The 70 points for the Axis, the two things in, Berlin, in Germany for the Allies, and then that secret thing at the end. I prefer playing the Axis side here because I really like I like knowing the secret of where I'm trying to go, trying to bluff, where that other player is kind of like, oh, what do I do here? Um, and so it, it, was, it was really fun. Um, it, it really did feel like there was a fog. Like, you don't know what's going on, you're trying to plan things, but other things are happening, you're trying to react to them. Then you throw the neutral things in there. Uh, the asymmetry was great. The different winning conditions was great. So overall, this is a fantastic, fantastic game um, that I think is very well designed. Now, again, it's got quite a bit of learning curve, uh, especially if you're going to try to learn it from the rulebook. And there's some things that could have made the game amazing with the graphic design choices and the rulebook and stuff. But the game's still excellent. So if you're willing to invest the time to learn the game from the rulebook, go through it for the first time, spend two and a half hours, and really get it down, I think it's going to be worth it. Because on the other side of this is once you know how to play it, it's a fantastic game. The player I played this with, my friend, um, actually liked this better than Twilight Struggle. I have not played it, so I could not comment on that. But again, that's pretty high praise when someone plays this and says, I like this better than Twilight Struggle. I mean, this has a lot going on. There's a lot of little rules. You take over Paris, it takes over this and this. These countries, as soon as you attack, Russia comes in, and these ones don't come in this. There are a lot of moving parts to this game. Um, but overall, if you can play it enough that you understand all that, you know, to, it's kind of second nature, it's worth it because the game's excellent and that's Fog of War. This video was sponsored by Miniature Markets Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for backing me on Kickstarter, making this season become a reality. I'd like to especially thank those here that have backed me at the credit level. Now, these video reviews are also available by audio on our podcast. It's the intros and the final thoughts on GameboyGeek.com. Click podcast.